Uh, well, I had mentioned about a flagship university being preeminent, and uh, I want to talk about that in a second. But I, I figure I'll talk maybe about 15 minutes or so, and then open it up to any questions that you would have. So be thinking of a question. I look forward to them at the end of my, uh, my presentation. So if you look at the, the University of South Carolina's economic contribution to the state of South Carolina, the number we like to quote is $5.5 billion a year. And that's a significant economic contribution. Doug in the, heart, in the, in the uh, Moore School is the ones that figured out what that really is and how that computation was put together. But the return on investment, you would probably argue, is pretty significant for $5.5 billion as a contribution to the state every year. Key to that are our graduates and the graduates who go into the South Carolina workforce. So that raises a question as a flagship university being a preeminent institution in the state and a preeminent flagship institution in the nation, it's good that you are preeminent, that you have some of the best programs that we mentioned that attract the best students and attract the best teachers and have some incredible research opportunities. But the way I'm looking at a flagship university is one in the institution and the profession of higher education who are families and the students of South Carolina are our principal clients, we have a responsibility to serve the state. We have a responsibility and outreach to serve the people and to serve the students in K through 12. And when you look at that perspective in K through 12 as the pipeline of South Carolinian students who come to the University of South Carolina, it raises issues of access and affordability. Do they have the, the grades and the grade systems to be accessible to higher education throughout the state? Can they afford coming to some of these uh, higher education institutions? If you look at the composition right now of in-state students at the University of South Carolina as compared to out-of-state, we're at 55-45, 55 in-state, 45 out-state. Now, does that mean that the 45 who are out-of-state students, that when they graduate, they're going to go back to the state that they come from? I would just argue probably perhaps an assumption is that, that a majority of them will go back out of the state. Ideally, we'd love to see more students that when they graduate, they stay in South Carolina and they contribute with their degree to the South Carolina economy. And then we also have an affordability issue. For example, here's an interesting statistic. If, if you look at the average per capita income of the average family in South Carolina and compare that to the average public college tuition for that state, our average, our tuitions compared to the average per capita income is the highest in the nation. We rank 50 out of 50. Said another way that for the average family that wants to send someone to the University of South Carolina, and pay tuition, it will, that tuition will be 33% of their annual income. And it ranks us 50 out of 50. So this is something that I think we have to address. But the bottom line is we would love to see more South Carolina students who graduate from this institution and go into the South Carolina economy. And I believe we, we here at this institution share in the, respons in the responsibility along with the rest of the K through 12 system and the superintendents of those systems to develop those young men and women in that particular pipeline so that when they do graduate from high school that they are competitive and can gain access to the, some of the great uh, universities here within the state. We also need to address the affordability issues and we're working some of that with the legislature. And I just want to say right up front that the General Assembly has been phenomenal and has been very cooperative and I'm very grateful for their support this past year so that we can keep tuition uh, down and not increase tuition. And then I know that in this next session coming up, they're going to help us significantly in that regard as well. So I have a lot of thanks to the General Assembly as, a, as we try to keep tuition down so that our education programs can be affordable to the average South Carolinian family. There's some great exp expansion plans that are taking place with the University of South Carolina. I'd like to mention a couple of them. The first is the Campus Village that you might have heard about. It's a $240 million program. It's principally financed through 100% debt through bonds. Um, I would just say that we're excited that we're going to be able to put $240 million into the local economy here as we build that infrastructure. 
Uh, it was pretty it, bureaucratic just to get there. It took us nine legislative committees to finally get approval over a number of years. And uh, that's a bureaucratic challenge in itself. It almost wants to make you give up on all of that, but you know we were persevering as we went through that. Another expansion program that we're looking at is expansion of a stadium upgrade of our football stadium so that we can make it more competitive to the stadiums in the Southeast Conference. And that's a $22.5 million program. We've done the analysis that there's incremental revenue of 14 to $17 million a year principally in premium, premium seed, seating. But one of the challenges that we have is that we have a cap, a legislative statute cap on how much we can, we can borrow for, this, for the stadium. And that's limited at $200. I'm sorry, $200, uh, $200 million. I wish it was $200. But it's capped at $200 million and we're already there so that we don't have the legislative approval to go to the next $22.5 million, even though we have a low risk uh, payback program. And this is one of the other things that we're working with the legislature to try to get that cap raised so we can go and, and execute that program. Another expansion program that you might have heard about is the medical campus on Bull Street, which is up to $280 million, which also includes $55 million that we asked for from the state. We want to do the groundbreaking in 2022. That's when we think it will happen. We have to go through those nine legislative committees, so it's going to take us that, that long to finally get there. That's what we think. But the key to the, one of the keys to the success of this is that we'll maintain the current partnership that we have with the VA, the Veterans Administration, and the tremendous programs that they have on the campus where it is right now, and we'll still maintain that partnership. But the one partnership we're really excited about is the impending partnership with Prisma. And we'll partner with Prisma not only here in the Midlands, but also up in upstate as well. And I think that has tremendous potential as this thing expands. We recently had a two-day offsite where we brought all of the senior leadership together and all of our deans together to talk about where the university should go in the next two to five years as a strategic offsite to develop our strategic plan. And out of that, we came up with a vision statement to have that our university would be the preeminent flagship university in the nation with a mission statement that transforms the lives of the people of South Carolina, the nation, and the world, where the operative verb in there is to transform people's lives. We also came up with nine, I'm sorry, eight strategic priorities, and one of those strategic priorities addressed research. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about research. And the strategic priority number three, research, says that this university wants to become AAU eligible. Now, AAU, if you're not familiar with that, stands for the Association of American Universities. It's a, it's a premier elite association of 63 universities that, I mean, technically you can say they're the best research universities in the nation. Uh, they have a set of a threshold of what standards are necessary to get there. We want to be able to be eligible to get there. I'm not sure we'll ever get an invitation, but that doesn't mean we can't, be el we can't at least make ourselves eligible. And the key thing we need to do is to increase our research federal grants by $50 million a year, and I think we can do that. Since I've been here, research, I'm amazed at the research potential that exists. I'm amazed how much it exists really in the Department of Defense, which I think is, has been untapped thus far, and even the Department of Energy. And let me walk you through some examples. The Army, the United States Army, in the Department of Defense recently stood up a four-star command called the Army Futures Command. It has responsibility of all of the Army laboratories and all of the Army acquisition programs that translates to billions of dollars. Their deputy commander, a three-star general, is Jim Richardson, who, was, who coincidentally is a University of South Carolina graduate. So we had him down here for the Veterans Day football game. We made him our team captain. We laid the red carpet off for him. He loved being back, but he was also pretty smart. He brought his chief scientist with, with him. And she was with us pretty much all week. And she, in her words, she was amazed at the facilities that we have here. She was amazed at the programs, the research programs that we have here at the University of South Carolina. 
So some of the feedback we received from their visit is that the Army Futures Command is considering making the University of South Carolina the center for power generation for the United States Army that would address power generation all the way from nuclear power to a battery, a lithium battery, and to prove its capacity. So if that, something like that actually materialized, that's got tremendous potential and we're very excited about something like that. You know, just down the road in Aiken and across the border, the border and across the river from Aiken is another Army installation called Fort Gordon. And if you're not aware, Fort Gordon really is the hub of cyber and cyber warfare and cyber research for the Department of Defense. There are three significant cyber commands at Fort Gordon. One is the command that does training and doctrine, and they also have a laboratory. And there are students that go there for cyber training, also are students who want to get bachelor's degrees if they don't have them, or master's degrees, and they're very interested in those programs. Right across the river from Fort Gordon is USC campus, the Aiken campus. And uh, we're working right now to be able to get Aiken, USC Aiken, accessible to all of those programs so that they can have the educational programs for all those students that are going there to increase their educational enrollment. And we're excited about that. But what I'm really excited about is the research that the other two commands have, the, NET, the NSA, which is the, the highly classified command. And as we were sitting down talking to them, they said, yeah, we do research. As a matter of fact, we have partnerships now with about eight or 10 universities. And as he was listing all the universities that the NSA Cyber Institution had relationships with, guess which one was missing? South Carolina. So I said, can you include us? They said, we'd love to. So we're gonna to start to develop that partnership in the research that they do and be one of the universities that they partner with. And then the third command is the Army Cyber Command, which is currently at Fort Meade, Maryland, which is moving in, in its entirety all the way down to Fort Gordon. And the Army Cyber Command, which does offensive and defensive cyber operations, also has research requirements. And then we talked to them about partnering with some of their research requirements, so this is something we're gonna develop as well. If you talk about cyber in this corridor between here in Columbia to Aiken and across the border, there's some, inc there's some incredible potential. Three other cyber initiatives that are in the works right now is one with the South Carolina National Guard. The South Carolina National Guard has a cyber command and they need a building to put their headquarters in. And they're working right now with the state to be able to uh, put, get a building on the, on the University of South Carolina Aiken campus. And that would be a $30 million uh, building that they're trying to put in place. The command's already formed, they just need the building. And so we're, we're assisting them and helping them and working with the state to be able to get that building constructed. And again, it would be right across the, the river from Fort Gordon, be right there in Aiken and would be on the USC Aiken campus. I'm not sure if you ever heard of the Georgia Cyber Institute, but the Georgia Cyber Institute is a public-private partnership that really addresses cyber issues in the state of Georgia. So we've been in discussions now with a number of people here it, with, the, with the governor, with the mayor, and, and other folks about what would it take to put together a South Carolina Cyber Institute that would be a public-private partnership that would address cybersecurity in our power infrastructure, in our financial infrastructure, in our big data infrastructures, in our transportation infrastructures. And those cyber, those are all very vulnerable to cyber, cyber issues. So how do you come together in a public-private partnership to be able to figure out how best to secure them? And the third initiative you heard in the introduction that when I was at West Point, we stood up the Army Cyber Institute, which has two main purposes, one to do research and, and two to develop public-private partnerships. And we used to partner with universities all the time when I was up there. Now that I'm down here, I called them up and asked if you can partner with us. They said, Sh sure. But one of the things that they do on a normal basis, they travel around the United States, sit down with big cities, and they have this tabletop exercise called the Jack Voteic exercise. And what happens in this exercise is you have a major cyber attack that really tears down some of the infrastructures that I just mentioned. And then you figure out how to repair that as quickly as you can, how to respond to that. And then in the after action review, look about how, you would, you, how would you defend your, your very vulnerable infrastructures in the civilian world so that um, that would not happen in reality. 
So we're looking for them to come down here to Columbia to be able to do something with us as well. But just look at this vision of a cyber cor corridor all the way from Fort Gordon with the Department of Defense cyber commands that are there to include a research center all the way to our National Guard cyber command right across the river with USC Aiken providing educational opportunities for the cyber students to all the way for us here doing cyber research with each one of those commands and then the South Carolina Cyber Institute coming in together in a partnership to be able to protect our, our critical and vulnerable infrastructure, uh, infrastructures that are out there. And I think all of that's possible, and this is something that we in the university want to play a big part in. Tomorrow, if you look down that area too, just down the river, I'm going to go down there and visit them. Tomorrow is the Savannah River National Lab. I'm not sure how much, or how many of you know about the Savannah River National Laboratory, but from the economic contributions to the state of South Carolina, it's pretty amazing. They're really looking, they're really focused on hazardous waste and hazardous waste storage and removal. But there is currently a request for a proposal that will most likely come out in the next couple of weeks that will also not only look at hazardous waste storage, but also look for research opportunities and scientific research. And this is something we're very excited about. And we believe that that request for proposal will include a partnership with a flagship university, which would be the University of South Carolina. So we're in conversation with a number of companies right now. And if, if that proposal comes out, how would we partner with them so that we in the university can be, able, can be a participant with Savannah River National Laboratory and to do some of the research there? Incidentally, they've already, I was told that the Savannah River National Lab already agreed to put a $50 million research facility on the University of South Carolina Aiken campus. And uh, so, so I don't know the timeline for that. I'm excited about that and the fact that they would go up there and, and link the University of South Carolina and their research opportunities is fantastic. You know, great organizations have the intellectual agility to recognize opportunity and when opportunity may not be there to have the, the agility to be able to create it. I think a couple, part, a couple examples of that are some of the partnerships that are, that are available in this, in this particular state, and in particular, one in particular right here in the city just around the corner from us, and that is a partnership with the mayor of Columbia on the convention center expansion. Our piece of this is really easy. It's just to widen the road and make that accessible. There's a piece of land that the university owns and potentially we can put an academic building there to be part of this particular expansion. And the plans are really fantastic. But what really excites me is they want to put three hotels there. And I'm very interested in one hotel so that if we partner with that particular hotel, what I'd love to do is to take our our students, particularly our students in the hospitality majors in the hospitality uh, college, and to be able to run that, ho that uh, hotel all the way from the chambermaids to the waiters and waitresses in the, in the, rest in the, um, ho uh, the, uh, the restaurant, all the way up to the HR and all the way up to the CEO. It would be run completely 100% by our students so that they get experiential learning and learning opportunities right here uh, adjacent to the University of South Carolina campus. What a win-win it would be not only for us, not only for the city, but also for our students and what they would learn. And another thing I'm very, just talking out loud, another thing I'm very interested in is to, tr to really look through across the state of South Carolina and look where the educational needs are across the state. For example, can we build here at the University of South Carolina, can we build a downtown campus someplace? Say for example, that would partner with a major corporation like Boeing so that through this cooperation and some of the research requirements they have that would really enhance our aeronautical engineering programs. Or that you can take some of the hospitality uh, work that we do here in, the, in our hospitality college and bring that down to the recreation and tourist industry down along the coast. And there's, I think, tremendous opportunities there that we want to look at and we want to explore. So in conclusion, I would just say that the potential for, for our state's economy, I think, is unlimited, and the potential is extremely, extremely positive. We'll see what they tell you later on throughout the day, but I'm excited about it. We here at the University of South Carolina want to partner with 
uh, the state. We want to partner with the city. We want to partner with the, the federal agencies, like I had mentioned before. We want to contribute to the, economy, the economic development of our state. And we're also hoping to bring many of these activities right here at the University of South Carolina. So let me stop there and I look forward to whatever questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, with your talk, with your discussion here about the K through 12 world um, and some of the things you've mentioned, the convention center, et cetera, I, you're probably familiar that we have two governor schools. One's in Hartsville. Uh, these are high schools, uh, somewhat elite in, in terms of academics. We also have one in Greenville. Um, we have no governor school uh, here in Columbia. Um, and it sounds to me uh, that uh, you have a possibility of a great opportunity to build the governor's school for business and entrepreneurship or the governor's school for cyber dot 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 uh, down at one of these buildings that you're going to move out of as you move to the new convention center so I hope you'll you'll throw that in there is a small but aggressive group that uh, is very interested in trying to do that thank you yeah no thanks very much you know you, you probably were tracking that I was over the last couple of weeks spent a lot of time on the road traveling around the state talking to high school superintendents and and really working with our our school of business I mean I'm sorry our school of education the Dean John Peterson and some of the work that he's doing is really incredible he is dedicated and committed to developing teachers and students in a number of different programs across the state this, we ha I had not heard of the governor's uh, school before until I was traveling around just the last couple of weeks. Uh, the thought of having one here in Columbia to include some of the initiatives that you had mentioned, I think is a great idea. And uh, so I jotted it down already and we'll, I want to look into it. Yes, sir. If you didn't hear him, he's on the board of trustees for the governor's school, so it's a personal invitation to come check it out. So you're on, sir. Got it. Question right up front. Thank you. For, thank you for your presentation. My name is uh, Ravi Ravindra. I'm from the Blue Cross Blue Shield, South Carolina. You talked about um, cyber, and you talked about research. I was wondering, um, as you, as we read today, the next war will be fought not on the ground, it would be in the cyberspace. So do you believe that there are other opportunities in South Carolina, especially at the USC, to increase the research that you talked about towards artificial intelligence, machine learning, because the, the cyber threat that we have today is no longer just created by programs, it is with the sophisticated tools like the AI and ML. As you start talking about the business school, what about other schools in the university, like engineering, physics, math, and other areas? So I was just curious, how do we plan to address those uh, emerging needs that we don't have today in the state of South Carolina? Yeah, I think you almost answered your own question. They are indeed critical to coming up with uh, comprehensive solutions to some of the different uh, challenges that are going to be out there in, in the battlefields of the future. Um, cyber is just one. Artificial intelligence is tremendously important. I, I saw a video, and this is already in the creation, where so you want these anti-tank missiles. And instead of being manned missile systems, they're artificially intelligence manned systems. And they're dropped by parachute off of, out of an airplane. And then because they're scattered and as they exit the airplane, they land, they recover their own parachute for camouflage purposes. And then when an attack is pending, an armor attack is pending, someone flies over there and activates them. And then as soon as they're activated, their sensors identify the approaching armor and then the anti-take missile will take them out. Not a single human being in any of that. It's all artificially done. So, so this is warfare of the future. What I described is not a cyber warfare. It's an engineering warfare. It's artificial intelligence engineering. It can be cyber because maybe someone wants to 
get in there and jam all the signal systems through, through cyber mechanisms to be able to do something like that. Uh, but it really is an integrated battlefield that is not only going to address just cyber, it's going to address engineering, um, electronic warfare, and things like that. And it's all got to be integrated together. So we're not only going to be needing cyber warriors, we're going to be needing system analysts and uh, system engineers to be able to pull all that together.